It is my great pleasure and honor to have a real YouTube star on our um, university course, Dr. Benjamin Cowan from Into the Cryptoverse. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me, Martin. Pleasure to be here. And thanks for the invitation to come on. So uh, Ben has a YouTube channel with uh, 10, almost 10 million views. And I always like Ben's channel a lot. I mean, being somebody who is who's trying to keep up with the digital revolutions for the last uh, last few decades, I always have to inform myself also with with the latest influence of the latest technology. And when I ran into Ben's content, I was really impressed because first of all, Ben is somebody who understands the math. Second of all, he does have a PhD. Now you don't need a for everybody. You don't need a PhD to understand the math, but that gives also Ben to be the full credentials to actually be. He could be a, a complete guest lecturer here a co-teacher on this on this official university course. I mean, we are the most comprehensive research university here. And, and so I, I really appreciate that. And you, you find that far and in between. And third of all, what really got me hooked on, on Ben's channel, he coined the term, uh, became a catchphrase, dubious speculation. And quite literally, Ben made a t-shirt out of that. So he really has the t-shirt of dubious speculation. And I think that is extremely important that especially when we speculate about technology and how technology evolves and the future of technology, and now it's the blockchain and artificial intelligence and so forth. Speculation is speculation and some things we can say with some confidence intervals. And that's that's why I really appreciate about uh, about Ben. And I'm, it's, an, it's a big honor to have him on here. Yeah, again, thanks for having me. But I, I will say I only have a little less than 800,000 subscribers, not not millions. There you see, already an exaggeration. <laughs> and you have a, a series in your channel called The Beauty of Mathematics, which, which got me hooked. So I wanted to ask you as somebody here among us who are also studying from academia, what's the importance to understand, you know, also real math and statistics, especially if you get into a field like, you know, like cryptocurrency, where there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of influencers and you and that scene you you enter that hot part of YouTube and social media where there's a lot going on. Um, what's your suggestion also for our viewers here and how do you approach this craziness of the of the next new hype with, with your mathematical foundations? So the way I approach crypto in general is to assume that in the short term, the price moves akin to say geometric Brownian motion, which is like a, a random walk. But over the long term, it more so will slowly trend higher with time as, as crypto is, is increasingly adopted throughout the world. The general trend should still be up, you know, just like we've seen other asset classes do over the last century where they go through painful periods, but they still eventually become, you know, what we know and love today. And I think some of the best companies in the world now were born out of the dot-com crash. There's got to be an, a more interesting way to navigate these volatile markets. And, and one of the reasons I thought that was because I, I had been burned so many times in crypto. So then I thought, well, maybe there's a, a way that we can take a step back and, and look at the more cyclical nature of crypto so as to not fall for the hype when, you know, when we're at the peak of a bull market and, and, and vice versa. So that's generally how I, I came to create the channel. And ever since then, I've just tried to grow it to help people better understand risk adjusted returns and, and, and incorporating things like modern portfolio theory into navigating crypto. Right. And, and that is I think that is a very uh, that's a very important approach because we forget that a little bit. Right. The moon boys and the hundred eggs and the Lumbo and everything that's going on in the in the cryptoverse as well. And in this course, we also looked at how there were, you know, in the beginning of the 1900s, there were 700 car companies and see how many are left over. And we talk about the theory, about the, the installation period of a paradigm and then a recession, a bear market, and then the deployment, the golden age. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So what we looked at is the dot-com bubble. We looked at Amazon going from $5 down to 30 cents, taking 10 years to recover. And then well, did it go to the moon? Where is it going? Can you walk us through that a little bit, how you see that and what you learn actually from the past? So studying the past, I mean, what can we learn about when we look at these new innovations? Yeah, so the interesting thing about, about the dot-com crash is that it lasted for more than two years. Um, the, the actual peak occurred in March of 2000, and, and the bottom did not occur actually until October of 2002, which is quite a long bear market. I think a lot of people 
my generation especially have not really experienced things like that. And so we're sort of just used to asset prices going up and to the right. But we do know that when you get these, you know, these overhyped times where it, it doesn't mean that the technology is not great. It, it is. It's just that we sort of get ahead of ourselves. We have a habit speculation, right? Dubious speculators have a habit of, of getting ahead of ourselves with the technology because we we see the future. But in reality, it actually takes a lot longer for the real world to catch up to where we think the future is going. Before we dive in closer to the NASDAQ, just look at, at sort of what's happened since then. So, I mean, yes, this was a, a painful period in the NASDAQ where it, went, it was a bear market for two and a half years. But what came out of it were some of the best companies of today. I mean, we have Apple, we have Amazon, we have Google, and so on and so forth. And these companies were, you know, of course, they did not perform well during this period, but that did not mean that they were dead. It did not mean that they were not going to go on to, to much higher levels. The trick, of course, is knowing which ones are going to survive. <laughs> and in the same way, back during the dot-com crash, there were a lot of companies that did not survive. We might think about, there, there's, I'm not going to mention any specific ones, but there were plenty of companies that that did not survive that. It, it, it's sort of a lesson that, you know, the blue chips or, or the, you know, the ones that are actually doing something and have real world utility, those are the ones that will, will see new heights theoretically, eventually, if history is any indication based on what we saw with, with the dot-com bubble. But we always have to remember that just like the dot-com crash, there were plenty of plenty of companies that did not see you know the next bull market. They just sort of withered away into the depths of the cryptoverse. But again, you know, when you when you look at the Nasdaq, we can see just how how brutal the drop this was. It ended up being about you know a a seven or 84, 83, 84 percent drop over the span of two and a half years. Uh, we had several rallies along the way, each getting increasingly more difficult. Uh, to navigate, you had a 40% a rally early on, and then you had a 50% rally. And I, I have to imagine, and then by the way, then we had a 60, you know, a 60% rally or so. I have to imagine that, you know, anyone navigating the, the dot-com crash back then, you know, you think about 40% rally and, and you get excited, right? And then a 50% rally and then a 60% rally. And so <laughs> we have to think, we, we take a step back though, and we can see how every single one of those moves ultimately did not mark the bottom of that asset class. But just because it did not mark the bottom did not mean that eventually, you know, the, those all those lows were eventually taken out. So I think the thing we can learn from the dot-com crash is that sometimes technology like crypto, it, it looks really great because I think it is. And I, I think it will continue to trend higher as a function of time. I think I think the key thing to remember is that when you're when you're looking at an asset class like crypto, there are going to be a lot of growing pains associated with them, and and to just make sure we have we have the right long term outlook for the asset class, so you don't get you don't get stuck trading on some of the shorter time frames that probably don't really matter. That's that's a that's a great great way of looking at it. Now during these times of when we go down the bear market or a recession or maybe it's not even a recession in crypto sometimes just like bear market where where the market takes a breath it, it goes down well there's kind of like a, a cleaning out going on so Schumpeter calls it creative destruction that's the technical term creative it's an evolutionary force so many have to many have to cease to exist for the fittest to survive and there are two interesting aspects so there's one aspect with when it comes to cryptocurrency that calls my attention. There's one aspect that is very similar that I've seen in many other technological revolutions. There's kind of like the the inertia of the old socio-institutional powers to be and, and this struggle between the old and the new and the creative destruction between, until there is the diffusion of the new paradigm and how it's established itself. And then there's something else very interesting happening in the cryptocurrency is like that is different from, from other technological revolutions. That is, there's kind of like a mothership. There's Bitcoin. <laughs> and there's this thing that nobody knows where it comes from, really. Uh, and now the regulators as well, while uh, around the world trying to see like how they deal with it. And you work a lot about you compare the rest of the altcoin market and altcoin i think is defined as everything does not build bitcoin or the other coins right versus bitcoin and bitcoin has historically had about half of the 
half of the market cap. So maybe we can talk about, and you can choose these two things. Maybe we can talk about them separately. One is the older against the new and, and, and the inertia of the old powers to be, also financial powers. And there are many waves, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank messing with it. And the other one is this, this Bitcoin altcoin, uh, Bitcoin dominance outlook on things. And what's the role of this Bitcoin mothership, which makes this technological revolution somehow particular? Yeah, it's interesting because when you think back to the dot-com crash, it's not like there was one thing that was, you know, crazy different than all the other than all the other ones, right? You had a lot of different stock, com- you know, you had a lot of different companies, but it's not like you can point to one company that um, was, you know, the company, right? But with crypto, you can. It, it's Bitcoin, and and Bitcoin is is if it goes up, it can drag the market with it. If it goes down, it can drag the market with it. It is, it controls the ship. And you mentioned the Bitcoin dominance, which is, I I think, a very important metric that is often uh, not cared about within crypto because, and the reason it's not often cared about is because it's not, you know, it's not like the dominance can be something that you go trade necessarily, right? Like, it's not like you can go buy Bitcoin dominance or sell Bitcoin dominance. but what I think you can do with it is we can better understand when when the altcoin market is overvalued against Bitcoin, and we can better understand when the altcoin market is undervalued against Bitcoin. And I think there's sort of so, like an ebb and flow. So excuse me, so the Bitcoin dominance to define it, you define it. So we have the entire cryptocurrency market and there, whatever. How many coins are there? 3,000, 30,000? We don't, uh, yeah, there's you, tens of thousands, I think. Right. And then so Bitcoin dominance, you calculate. So Bitcoin is the most valuable. Let's say it's about, let's say roughly about half. Oh, oh, that's what it is. Bitcoin dominance. So that's the percentage of Bitcoin of the entire market cap of of cryptocurrency, right? Yeah. So essentially, if you were to take the market cap of Bitcoin and divide it by the market cap of the entire asset class, that's how you would get the dominance of Bitcoin. So we essentially just know, uh, you know, how much uh, just relatively speaking, where where does Bitcoin sort of hold up? And and there's a very cyclical component to it, where we we, we sort of go from low Bitcoin dominance to high Bitcoin dominance, back and forth. And and this is something that I've I, I've been a big proponent of for a long time because and the reason I, I say this is because I I really do think that the dominance of Bitcoin is is sort of the key to unlocking the secret of crypto because it it shows you. Again, when when everything else is undervalued or overvalued against Bitcoin. So if you think about Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is is a commodity. You know, you're not it's not like it's not like the other cryptocurrencies. And and when I think about the other cryptocurrencies, I more so think about like the tech sector. Like think about like, you know, the, the dot com crash, right? I, I think more about it, it, it's tech. People are trying to build things. You know, you have all sorts of things that, that people are people are trying to build. But at the end of the day, we can go back to the Bitcoin dominance. And there's two ways to measure it. There's including stable coins and excluding stable coins. And you know, if you if you exclude stable coins, we can see that it's been moving higher since May of 2021. And really, it actually has been moving higher since January of 2018 in terms of putting in higher lows. But it's also been putting in lower highs as well. And so if you were to extend this time frame out, you know, five years or something, and uh, we can sort of imagine that we're, we're going to be coming up to a point, you know, probably sometime by 2026 or so, where it's going to have to break out one way or another, right? It's either going to break to the upside or it's going to break to the downside. And, and so far, we just simply do not have the answer to that. I imagine the answer to that could be uh, in part due to, you know, what regulations ultimately say about about the cryptoverse. I'm hoping that we get some positive regulations so that people in the United States have the flexibility to build in the cryptoverse. <laughs> but but again, this metric here shows you when when the altcoin market is undervalued versus overvalued against Bitcoin. And, and you know, when it's sort of sitting at these very high levels at you know 85%, like in 2017, it was able to fall off a cliff. And that led to a lot of altcoins gaining ground on Bitcoin. But then during you know the bear market and then the recovery years from 2018 until 2020, the dominance of Bitcoin slowly went back up. And then you can kind of see the same thing repeating, right? I mean, the dominance dropped off a cliff from like 
percent or so. And then now it's just been slowly climbing back up. And so this is a, a, a very cyclical component of, of crypto. And, and, and the way that I navigate crypto to sort of tie everything back together is by valuing a portfolio in terms of its Bitcoin valuation, right? Or its Satoshi valuation. What is the valuation of your portfolio not denominated in US dollars? But denominated in in Bitcoin, and the reason the reason I say that is because um, in terms of in terms of risk, we we know that by market cap, Bitcoin is the highest. So then theoretically, it's lower risk, uh, but also it's not going to be subject to necessarily the same type of scrutiny that that the other that the other the, the altcoins will. And so I think we have to be careful. So when, when I think about the Bitcoin dominance, I just use it as a metric to figure out when the altcoin market is either undervalued against Bitcoin or overvalued. And when I find it undervalued, then I'm, I'm more interested uh, you know, in the altcoin market. When I find Bitcoin to be undervalued with respect to altcoins, then I'm, I'm more interested in Bitcoin. That's, that's very interesting. I want to call the attention of to, to our viewers to two things here. So first, I um, don't know if you can... You can see my notation here. So Bitcoin at the beginning, of course, had 100% of the market cap, right? Because it was, it, that was it. it, it crypto was, was Bitcoin. And then the other ones, uh, the other uh, came in. And what Ben was explaining to us here is that Bitcoin is usually seen as a commodity. So a commodity is more like oil or is something you can, that actually has or gold. They say that Bitcoin is kind of like the gold, it's a commodity. Uh, well, as others, um, Ethereum, ADA, Polkadot, and so forth, and, and Dogecoins and the rest, they are more, Ben said, more like tech stocks. So that's that companies that innovate in that space, if they're going to be classified and by who they're going to be classified as companies or commodities, that will be created uh, socially and uh, regulatorily created during the next, next years and, and decades to come. And that might also switch at that time. But Bitcoin, it was kind of like, since it's like this self-navigating, uh, ship that nobody really is in charge of, uh, same as nobody's in charge of, of all the oil or all the gold in the world, people see it more um, as, a, as a commodity. You also said Satoshi, and that is something very interesting else I want to pay attention to. You said you evaluate all the others against Bitcoin, and that's great because, you know, as they say, give me a stable place in the universe and I can move it with my small finger. We need some stable place. And the stable place is also not the dollar. The value of the dollar changes, the value of the euro changes, the value of the... And now we have Bitcoin. And then, gee, what is a Satoshi? Yeah, I mean, so it basically, it's just the smallest denomination of, of Bitcoin. So it can become difficult <laughs> because you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. You, you know, I think some people might have the understanding that if you go buy something, you have to buy like an entire an entire one, like you have to go buy the entire stock or something, not like a fractionalized version of the stock. But with with Bitcoin, you know, uh, Bitcoin is at, at the current time, it's very volatile, right? But at the current time, it's trading for around, uh, you know, 30,000 US dollars. And, and so when we think about, you know, people using Bitcoin or, you know, if they're valuing something in Bitcoin, whether it's whether it's an altcoin or whether you want to even value your, you know, your stock portfolio against Bitcoin. The issue is that if if the thing you're valuing against Bitcoin is only worth like a couple of dollars, then when you when you go look at your 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 Bitcoin valuation, it's just going to be like point zero 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 one, right? Or something like that. Yeah. And that that can be very difficult to work with. And so another way to, to look at it. Is if you just look at at you know a a, a fractionalized version of of Bitcoin, it, it's a it's a much easier concept for for I think a lot of people to grasp, right? You can say, all right, well this is 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 four hundred satoshis or or a thousand satoshis, which again this is just a small fraction of Bitcoin, but hopefully hopefully that clears clears that up. Yeah, I think there are hundred million satoshis in one Bitcoin, right? We don't use satoshis yet. Yes, yeah, so there's a so there's there's a hundred million satoshis, but but. That that is, I mean, I that's what I normally work with when I when I think about the altcoin market. I, I look at their their Satoshi value more frequently yeah. than I look at their USD value. There's also particularity in the cryptoverse, additionally to these usual cycles of technological innovation, similar to the dot-com bubble. Since Bitcoin is so dominant, there's also a particularity with Bitcoin and the famous 
four-year cycle. In general, there, there's an infinite number of waves on waves. In Bitcoin, there's also, since it's the dominant cryptocurrency, there's a four-year cycle programmed into, the, into it. Is that correct? And what effect does that have? Or maybe you can show us some graphs uh, because that, that can confuse the entire story a little bit as well, right? Yeah, so there's this uh there's the having the bitcoin having where the the block rewards to the miners are reduced by half and then so the the of course the narrative is that well if if the amount of bitcoin that the miners are receiving is reduced then that leads to less selling pressure on on bitcoin and that occur it's not it's not exactly every 4 years but it's basically 4 years right like right. so the first having was in november of 2012 the second one was in July of 2016. The third one was in uh, May of 2020. The next one, uh, it's hard to know exactly when it's going to be, but it, it's probably going to be sometime, you know, within the, you know, March, April or May or something of 2024. And so this happens approximately every four years. And at least so far, we've seen crypto do quite well in terms of in terms of its capitalization following the having now it's not necessarily as simple as that i think that it, it it fortunately has also historically corresponded to to quantitative easing and you know more favorable monetary policy and quantitative you know, we've easing, so so to interrupt is so the quantitative easing is when the government puts a lot of money into the market in order to help something like a pandemic or something if the uh, if the Federal Reserve is say printing a lot of money, then then that's favorable. If we're at low interest rates, then that's very favorable for risk assets in general. More favorable monetary policy is is good for for stocks and crypto. When we think about the halvings and we look back at the context of history, we can see that they've always corresponded to favorable monetary policy by the Federal Reserve. And and between now and then, we could go back to to favorable monetary policy, maybe just in time for the next Bitcoin having. Um, and and this leads to this very cyclical behavior that you see on on this chart of you know we we tend to grind out at some lower prices for a while, and and then we slowly trend back up, and and this process just keeps repeating. And and and, and you're right. I mean, it, it's a very cyclical thing you know, back to more favorable mon monetary policy, also in line with the Bitcoin having and this general idea of, of four-year cycles continuing to repeat themselves. So now what I call the attention to everyone here, so this is a, a semi-logarithmic graph, right? So this is a logarithm here. So these kinds of, of, of cycles here, you, you, are, you are here that is, so here's when Bitcoin was, I think, like almost at 20,000, right? And then it went oh. down here to what, to, to 3,000 right. maybe? So this chart, yeah. this chart that I'm showing is 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 of the total market cap of crypto, not just oh, yeah. right. Great. So yeah, that's the total market cap. And having it in, in in Bitcoin's term, which might be people, some people might be more familiar with. So here you have kind of like let's make it easy, uh, almost twenty thousand. Then here you go down to three thousand. Then you get here down to almost uh, or to seventy thousand. And then who knows? So you go down here. So these are big big swings as well that happen that are hidden. But in general, you see decreasing returns. So it comes a little bit flatter. And eventually, what will happen with these four-year cycles? I mean, many millionaires and billionaires are made and going bust here while these fluctuations are going on. But what do you think? What happens in the asymptote? What happens in the long term? Or what is expected to happen in the long term if you look at these graphs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think eventually we'll fall off of it. I, I don't expect us to follow it forever because it would almost... It's one of those things where, you know, every every time we always question it as if like, can it really be that easy? And then it just keeps happening, you know? So, yes, I mean, at, at some point, I would imagine that we will fall off the, the, the cyclical four-year cycle behavior, especially as as crypto is is more so fully capitalized and adopted. I mean, it it, it, it of course, can't just simply go up forever without, without meaningful, you know, um, Correction, you know, more more sustained corrective phases, like like what we saw during the dot com crash, and like we've seen during say periods of high inflation, like in the forties and the seventies, where where returns were just relatively flat for you know a decade or so. So I, I do think that will happen, uh, but until you know until we get to that point, I mean, so far it, it's just been a very cyclical thing, 
and and getting into Bitcoin, you know, when when no one else wants to get into it has has worked out pretty well. And and then when you when you find it on on sort of the headlines of every news outlet, uh, uh, you know, in, in mania phases, it's it, it, it has typically been a, a pretty hot time in the market and, and not not a sustainable move. Uh, by the asset class in general, and it just leads to you know to people making a lot of money and and losing a lot of money very very quickly. And and so mm-hmm. the the tools are you know that I that I'm showing on here are are basically designed to try to help people navigate it while managing their risk and and recognizing that there's there's no way to know exactly where things will bottom or exactly where they'll peak, but but just to try to manage your risk along the way. Right, that's been a, that's been the old game, and you can if it would be easy to predict, we would all be rich. But it's it's right. per, per definition, it's unpredictable because we mess up our predictability by fighting against each other, and you never know what happens. And yeah, I, I think that was very wise. It's very important to remember, right? What they what they say is be fearful when everybody is greedy, right? right. And so so that is when it when it when it's all over the news, it might already be a little. <laughs> A little too. Late. It might not be the best moment to go all in. Right. Exactly. And 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 really, it's never a great time, no matter what. It's about the family farm because <laughs> you never you never know what's going to happen with with volatile assets like crypto. Yeah. But 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 you know, I I do remain optimistic on on crypto uh, on cryptocurrencies future. I I just think we we will likely have some growing pains along the way as we as we navigate regulatory scrutiny and and we kind of see all that coming in right now. But those are those are growing pains. It's, it's only normal and and hopefully we will come out better for it on the other side. Generally, the asset class should trend higher with time if history, of course, is any indication. Yeah, <laughs> blockchain technologies are pretty solid. We talk about the in this course about blockchain technology and it's a it's an ingenious idea in general. Is there anything you want to add it? At the end, Ben, anything you want to want the want the students of this class of this course to know? Yeah, maybe one more thing. There's this theory, and I mentioned it earlier. It's called modern portfolio theory, and and it's interesting because this is a a theory that goes back decades, and it, it's often used by like hedge fund managers to to build portfolios within say equities and whatnot. But the idea is that you can maximize your risk adjusted returns based on historical returns if you were to use historical returns as your expected return right as your expected return going forward which is a dubious thing to do right but the idea is that annually based on historical returns you know various combinations of say like a bitcoin eth portfolio would give you uh, you know 70% uh, let's say that the, the sharp ratio here that that that, that maximizes your risk adjusted returns is is around this 65% annualized return level. But we must note that it's 65% plus or minus about 80%, which means that the 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 returns can can fluctuate wildly. And and this plus or minus 80% is likely to happen. So your your annualized return. If history is any indication for these types of portfolios, 65% plus or minus, say 75% or so, should be accurate within to within this one standard deviation, meaning the probability of the return going to in to that level is, is about 68% um probability. But but the in, the more interesting thing about this is that it shows you, you know, what portfolio weights are appropriate. For various types of investors, so like mm-hmm. if you're if you're looking to maximize your Sortino ratio, if you're looking to maximize your Sharp ratio, if you're looking to minimize your volatility, it shows you you know the portfolios that accompany that type of risk appetite. Well, the, the one of the most common things I see in the cryptoverse is 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 people sort of disagreeing on on you know what allocations there should be but in reality there's not a right answer you know what's right for me is going to be different for some you know for someone else what's right for someone who maybe is is about to retire is probably going to be different for someone who has a much stronger risk appetite if they're in their if they're in their early 20s so i i think by using this sort of stuff we can we can kind of better assess what what types of portfolios are 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 more appeal, uh, appealing to various types of investors. And, and the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, this is because it's only two different assets right here. So this, the two assets, sorry to interrupt, so the two assets here, it's Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
And, right. and the question is how to balance them. Right. Yeah. The, so essentially what right. So in this case, this is displaying five thousand and fifty thousand portfolio simulations. So it's basically oh, wow. a Monte Carlo, a Monte Carlo brute force type of approach. So you wow. run fifty thousand simulations, you figure out based on historical results, what portfolios would have maximized your sharp ratio, what portfolios would have maximized your Sortino ratio, and which ones would have minimized your volatility. And, and this is so this right here is called the efficient frontier. Now, the efficient frontier for only two assets is not that interesting because there's no depth to it. But if you add a third asset, let's add Litecoin to the mix and you recalculate it, you get something that looks like this. So what this is, the green line up here is, is known as the efficient frontier. You can sort of think about the red line as the inefficient frontier because your expected returns based on those portfolio allocations are, are actually lower uh, than they would be up here for taking on you know, the exact same amount of risk if you're using volatility as sort of like your proxy for what risk you're taking on. But again, you know, when we talk about you know, the so well, going back to say like the Bitcoin dominance and 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 you know the idea of 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 certain coins becoming undervalued and overvalued. You know, you can look at at things like the Sharp ratio and Sortino ratio for say Bitcoin, ETH, and Litecoin, and still see that they they essentially call for no weight in Litecoin. Now, that's not to say that Litecoin can't outperform, but we always must remember that there's an opportunity cost to everything that we do, right? So, like, you know, if you go buy a cup of coffee for five dollars that's five dollars you didn't put into the market but if you go buy an altcoin and you put five dollars into an altcoin that's five dollars that you didn't put into bitcoin or you know or or another cryptocurrency so you must always think about what is the opportunity cost it's not that these assets can't go higher again bitcoin can you know the the the, the tide can lift all boats right but it's which ones continue to to trend higher as a function of time and then which ones which ones don't uh so that, that i thought this would be a good one to end on because it is a bit more a bit more mathematical and and anyone can do this and and, and by the way that sort of answer one question that i get um one common question is is well if we ran another fifty thousand simulations will we come up with different results and the answer is yes but in terms of calculating out the Sortino ratio and the Sharp ratio, you can brute force it as well using quadratic programming. And, and so you don't actually have to worry about running a million different simulations. You can identically solve for the portfolio that would have maximized your risk adjusted returns without running a, a, a brute force approach. So I just wanted to mention that mm -hmm. uh, because this is a, a, a great way, in my opinion, to, to navigate crypto. Yeah, so you find the, you find the invariant distribution um, very quickly, which is which is amazing, and I think that's a. That, thank you for bringing that up. That's a very good way in looking at technological technological revolutions in general. So the the idea of bed hedging, by the way, Mother Nature does the same things in her evolution. So now mutation selection retention, mutation selection retention. That's how the evolutionary algorithm works, and she hedges her bets while she's going forward. And if, if we don't know how things turn out, the best way is also not to put all eggs in one, into one, one basket because that could wipe you out. So to right. bed hedge in general, and even that we have the mathematical tools is amazing. Thank you for bringing that up. The mathematical tools to see what theoretically would be the optimal, how to put how many eggs into which basket in order to, with the least risk or with the most reward or whatever ratio you want to take. You want more reward, you want less risk, you want it faster, you want it slower, and then we can decide how we go through this process of creative destruction. And once we're on this other side, there will be a new technological revolution and the entire, <laughs> and the entire thing starts again. So thank you very much for bringing that up, Ben. That was a, that's a great ending. No problem. So I, I suggest everybody, I kindly invite you to check out um, Ben's series, especially the beauty of mathematics, on the, one of my favorite ones, and and uh, and Ben's education about about the cryptoverse. Thank you very much for taking on the time and coming here to join us in the in this University of California online course. Thanks, Shami, and um, uh, thank you for inviting me on. It was a pleasure to to talk, and I, I do hope that people, you know, that the students find this valuable.